Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. I didn't originally plan on making this video, but right at the end, when I went to put it back together, things really went haywire. So I thought it was worth taking a look at what went wrong and what I tried to do to fix it. While the story doesn't have a happy ending, a lot was learned along the way, which, you know, maybe we can apply to future projects. So let's jump right in to see what happened. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. Whether you need a small, simple board like this or a larger, more complicated design, head on over to PCBWay.com, click on PCB Instant Quote, upload your files, and select from the plethora of options available. PCBWay offers a wide range of products and services, including assembly, stencils, and PCB design. When you have a need for circuit boards, Head on over to PCBWay.com and give them a try. I found a good deal on a couple of CE-150s. Well, one sharp CE-150 and one of the Radio Shack equivalents, which was the 26-3605. The sharp labeled unit was in rough shape though. The fumes from the corroding NICAD battery pack even seeped through the joint in the case and attacked the paint. So I took it apart to see if it could be salvaged and found a lot of corrosion from the NICAD battery pack leaking. The RF shield was badly corroded on the side opposite the PCB and on the PCB side, which was covered with a sheet of plastic, it was a little more protected. The paint on the underside of the stainless steel docking plate was bubbling up and the leads on a large number of components were turning black. The section of the PCB where the battery leads connected had the most damage. There was a good deal of copper trace corrosion, but minimal component damage. I mixed up a new concoction to remove the corrosion from the PCB. It did a good job, but it'll be the subject of another video as I'm still running tests on the process. There was some trace damage on the PCB, the worst area being centered around the pot, which adjusts the low battery warning circuit. The area was cleaned up, tinned with some solder, and then top coated. I then set about to repair the damage. The case cleaned up pretty well with a magic eraser. It's not perfect, but it's much better than it was. The loose bubbling paint on the bottom of the docking plate was just scraped off since it is hidden and it will not rust. The RF shield was stripped of its plastic sheet on the PCB side. The rust was removed and it was painted. Then the plastic sheet was cleaned and glued back in place with spray glue. At this point, I botched in a temporary pot to be able to test the board, and it seemed like it worked perfectly fine. I even made a new battery pack with some tabbed nickel metal hydride cells. We'll cover this process in an upcoming video as well. The closest pot I could find to fit the location was only 20K, not the 22K of the original, but I figured as long as it could be adjusted to the proper voltage trip point, it would work. Plugging in the PC2 for this test required some precarious placement of items under the PC2 and the flex circuit board with the expansion connector on it to keep everything separated and from shorting out. I borrowed a PACE circuit repair kit from a friend and used some of the PCB via ferrules to fix the through holes for the pot. Luckily the service manual had the adjustment procedure for the pot. You have to apply the correct voltages to two locations VCC and point B and adjust the pot until you get one volt at point A. It's a very touchy adjustment as well, but the 20K pot worked fine and all seemed well. The way the battery pack is used is also odd. The battery voltage is only used to directly drive the printer and relays. This is the red line. It's also fed through a diode up to the computer as VBAT. This is the yellow line. The power supply in the computer regulates this down to about four volts called VCC, which is fed back out to the CE-150 to power the circuitry therein. I then set about to reassemble the unit, and as it had been apart for more than a month, it took a while to remember where everything went. I did get it put back together after a few tries, and I tried to save something to the cassette without a tape deck hooked up, and then all seemed to go fine. Then it quit working. Not only did it not work, but it locked up the PC-2, which had to be hard reset to get it to work again. I was really confused. To me, it seemed like there was an issue with the CE-150 powering the PC-2. 
Here we've got the circuit board out of the PC2's cassette interface, which looks like this. Put this rag in here so we don't short anything out. And this flex circuit board connects up into the case kind of like so. And the computer plugs in like this. Right now I've just got it on the DC wall board. The battery pack would normally be connected down here. It is not connected and I want to show you that the computer itself does work fine. This is a little precarious hooking it up like this. But we'll go like this and I'll set this end on this roll of tape. I think I've replicated the fault and I'm going to turn it on and it may not do anything. It may make a strange beeping sound. We may get garbage on the screen. The symptoms vary somewhat. And each time you try it, the results are a little different. Sometimes you'll get strange errors. Sometimes it'll beep. Sometimes you get corruption across the screen. But always, it does not work. I was then worried about this edge of the Flex PCB starting to peel up and thought it might be providing an intermittent connection. Sometimes when I pressed on this connection just right, it seemed to work briefly. I ohmed out all the connections from the expansion connector to the PCB and all seemed okay. Knowing that the Flex PCB seemed okay, I was really confused as to what was happening, especially considering that it seemed to work at times if I pressed on that side of the PCB. I began to inspect the entire PCB with a lighted magnifier and ohmed out a few suspect traces which turned out to be okay. Looking closely at the stepper driver chip in the lower left hand corner, I noticed one of the wires going to the printer. It had a few loose strands that was touching another wire. I separated the wires and it worked, well sort of, it worked several times. Sometimes it would throw up an error and then it started locking up the computer again. So the shorted stepper motor wire was not the only issue. Now you might be thinking, hey Bert, how would that cause a problem on the PC to itself and lock it up? Well, that's a darn good question and one I was asking myself. It all comes down to the boot up procedure of the CE150 and how the CE150 powers the PC2 and how in turn the PC2 powers the CE150. When the PC2 is docked, the CE150 sends VBAT to the PC2 and the PC2 returns a regulated VCC, which is about 4 volts, to the CE150. In this mode, the PC2 is powered by the CE150, not the internal AA batteries. The only thing the battery pack and the CE150 powers is the stepper motors and the two relay coils. When the PC2 is docked to the CE150 and you turn it on, the first thing it will try to do is initialize the printer. Basically, the stepper motor wires shorting created a short circuit on the PC2's power supply, which caused a problem, but this was not the only problem. Knowing that the frayed wire was no longer causing a problem, I began to focus on the flex PCB connection again. I noticed that if I pressed on the PCB just above the stepper driver chip, it would work. The flex PCB is connected to the rigid PCB with some conductive glue. I have heard that reheating this with a soldering iron might reactivate and seal the glue, but this didn't work. Maybe due to the battery corrosion. In the TRS-80 PC2 manual, there was a page talking about detaching and reattaching the keyboard flex PCB. Having nothing to lose at this point, I gave it a go on the CE150 board and well, it was a disaster. I tried to peel it up from the side, which did not work out well. I switched to using a plastic spudger tool inserted from the inside and this worked well, but much damage had already been done. The only choice I had now was to try and glue the lifted pads back down and reattach the flex. So what I'll do is put some epoxy under these lifted pads, slide this piece of plastic over to flatten them out, try to get them all straight, slide it down here to the edge, carefully holding it down, and then put some cap tan tape over the back here. That is the theory. And of course, I'm not going to do this on camera because I don't think I could do that. But I'll give this a shot and I'll show you the taped results. And then we will look at it tomorrow evening after it's had a chance to cure. I mixed up some of this Circuit Works epoxy. This is designed to be an overcoat in replace of the 
uh, solder mask, but it is a high temperature epoxy and it works pretty good for glue and traces back down too. And it's not that expensive. Take a little plastic pokey tool and put some epoxy back under all of those loose pieces of trace. I smeared it flat with that piece of plastic you saw earlier. And I put a, holding the plastic here, put a piece of tape, captain tape down here, which just kind of held them in place basically. And then I took some smaller pieces of tape this way. I just captain tape. And before I wrapped it all the way around the board, I took a little screwdriver and kind of pushed the ends of the traces around to line everything up. And it actually lined up a lot better than I thought it might. Here is the result of our first repair attempt at gluing that down. See, there's just a few of the tips that didn't glue down properly, and all the excess epoxy cleaned off there fairly easy. So I am going to put a new pad in for this guy, connect it with some solder here, and then I'll mix up some more epoxy to glue this pad down, and then we'll get the ends of these others. And there's a few here on the tip that also weren't there. You can see that a little better. Those four right there weren't glued down really well. So we'll try all those again. And well, I still don't know if it'll work, but it's made a big improvement so far. So we'll give it another whack. Here is where we are at after our second round of gluing. Now to peel this stuff off, what I try to do is get one corner of the tape and peel it slowly like that. You see it leaves some mess on there, some extra epoxy, but in my experience that's been pretty easy to clean up. This board is thick enough. And you can see right here is where I joined this replacement pad, which is a little wider, so I might have to trim it a little bit, but it's stuck on there good. As you can see, it's really close at this point. So I will have to do some cleanup right there with the knife, probably with a new blade in it. To clean up these traces, I'll very carefully scrape them toward the edge, like so, just to get the worst of the epoxy off of there. This is much easier to do under the lighted magnifier. Follow up with the fiberglass brush like this. And we'll do that for all the traces so they are nice and shiny, and then we'll tin them up like we did these here. After getting everything glued down, I tried to use a no clean flux to tin the pads and had a second disaster. The flux dissolved the epoxy and I had to try to glue things down again. After three attempts, the pads were in bad shape and the chances of success were slim. Well, here is the state we are in right now, which isn't very good. All these pads are mostly stuck back down. I had stuck them down with the epoxy and then tried to tin them and I found out that the no clean flux I was trying to use actually dissolved the epoxy which was quite a disaster so disaster number two so I cleaned all that up and glued them back down again with the epoxy and I will just use regular rosin flux now but I've got the flux all stuck down and tinned I do need to tin these pads here again, so we'll work on that. You know, I give this maybe a 25% chance of working. I'm not too confident in it, but at this point it's a learning experience. I thought one thing we might be able to salvage out of this whole thing is uh, demonstrating how a professional circuit trace repair kit works. Uh, this second pad here from the top uh, came off on the bottom and it has a trace leading from it, so I'll show you how a pro repair on those are done. Uh, the kits for these are kind of prohibitively expensive for hobbyists. 
uh, I know I couldn't justify one, you know, for my vintage computer hobby, but the feral part that we'll see is available rather inexpensively from China. I've got some of those on order to try them out. The lead frames are another story. Let's have a look at those. Here is the ferrule or eyelet. It's basically a tin plated copper tube that's flared out on one end. And you use this to replace the through hole plating. These come in various lengths and diameters. This one is about one millimeter in diameter, like three millimeters long. And then there are various lead frames like this, which are basically replacement circuit trace elements. I cut a section out of here to replace that missing pad. It has a little bit of trace coming off of it. And there are all sorts of different shapes and sizes for replacing different things. Uh, the bad thing is, each one of these little lead frames is about $30. Yeah, you can replace a lot of missing pads for that, but that's still kind of expensive. I'm not sure of a more hobbyist-friendly way uh, around this problem, though, but I've been thinking about it. Okay, the little ferrule I'm using is a millimeter in diameter on the outside. So I have a little drill bit here that is slightly bigger than a millimeter. So I will start from the top side here and very carefully try to drill this out. Now these carbide drill bits are brittle. And I don't like trying to do this with a drill motor or even a manual drill because the copper grabs a lot and it's very easy to break the bit and breaking the carbide bit down on the hole would ruin your day. I'll flip the board over and work at it from the back a little bit. This one may have been a little easier if I'd started with a slightly smaller drill bit. Okay, this drill bit is slightly less than a millimeter. See if that makes it easier. I hope you can see there. Yeah, that's cleaning out the hole much easier. Okay. Now we'll go with the one that's slightly over one millimeter. Okay, now I've got that cleaned out. And if we try the ferrule... It should slip down through there like that. Okay, now I'm going to take a little bit of a trace and drop him into place like so. Then we will slip our ferrule down through the hole in the trace segment. You can see what we've got going on right here. I make a set of tools for this, which I do not use entirely correctly. But I just use them the way that I found works best for me. I've got the tool on the back side pressed into the ferrule. These are just basically pointy sticks. You can take your other pointy stick from the other side and wobble it around like this. You're just flaring out the top of that. And when you're done with that, you wind up with a rivet, basically, that's holding your new trace segment in place. And that's a lead from your chip will go through. And here's the result of our repair. We've got an overlap here to the existing trace. We'll put a little flux on there and tack that down. And then our solder will flow around the pin and it'll flow through because of the eyelet to the other side. And we'll have a nice repair. Now we'll go ahead and see if we can get that other side tinned. I am not holding my breath. Okay, here we go. Apply just a tiny bit of rosin paste flux. Just 
Just trying to leave a little on each pad. I have a little bit of a loose pad right here. But it seemed to tin up okay. Okay, that's tinned up. It really looks like crap. But we'll see what happens. First thing I want to do though is put a little cap tan tape across here to cover where I patched in this new pad. Okay, I've got some cap tan tape along here. This will help protect the tips of this from contacting any of these vias and it protects that little dude right there. And what I'm going to do is line this up about halfway back because I need room to place the soldering iron. And I will tip this to this and we'll give a shot at soldering it. Let's see what happens. Okay, this is lined up as good as I can get it looking under the, the lighted magnifier like so. And what I will do now is Press down on a pair of these pads lightly like this. Touch the soldering iron to each pad that's sticking out and try to reflow those together. I've added some more flux on there. And we'll see what happens. As I mentioned, I'm not holding my breath. This is just an experiment at this point. Okay, it's kind of stuck down there somewhat. I'm finding I need a way to push this whole thing more flat as I'm heating up a section. Okay, I've got this brush here, which is kind of flat on the end. So try pressing down like, oh, you can't see anything. Try pressing like this. I'm holding a whole section of the flex flat. I touch each pad. And so on. And I'll do that one down the line. What I did was ohm out all the various power leads to make sure nothing was shorting between the power feeds and the ground and the signal traces. And I have it plugged into my bench power supply so I can current limit it. And I powered it up and it was not drawing any power, which it shouldn't like this because there's no battery connected. Um, the computer is working now, so we'll plug it in and I'll give it a quick try. I don't think it's going to work, but you never know. Okay, here we go. No, I don't know if you can hear that beep over the power supply fan. Yeah, there's definitely a problem. Something's not making contact. It's not locking completely up this time. But it is definitely not going to work. Darn it. Well, this refurb really wound up being a disaster. In fact, it was a disaster squared. Not only did we have the original problem trying to remove this flex PCB from the rigid PCB, but using the no clean flux dissolved the epoxy and we had to glue it multiple times, which really turned out bad. I found though that I often learn more from failures than success. And there were a lot of things I learned on this project. You know, to start with, the chemical soup I mixed up to clean the corrosion off the PCB worked rather well. And making that new tabbed battery pack also worked well, and those will be the subjects of upcoming videos. The type of epoxy I used to glue the pads back down has worked well for me in the past on things like service mount capacitor pads, but I'm not sure if it's the best thing to use for large scale repairs like this. Definitely using that no clean flux on it was a disaster. I have read about some single part heat set epoxy, which I might give a try in the future for repairs like this. I do have a few more of these CE150 cassette slash printer interfaces, and we'll do a full refurb on one of those in an upcoming series about the Sharp PC1500 and Radio Shack PC2. Look for that in the near future. 
As always, I'd like to take a few minutes and say thanks to everyone who supports the channel through Patreon and other means. Your help makes it all possible, and I really appreciate it. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a supporting member, just look in the description down below. There's some links there. Also, thanks to everyone who subscribes and watches the videos. You know, if you're not a subscriber, what are you waiting on? If you look down below, you'll see a rectangular button that says subscribe in there. Just click on that guy and you'll be subscribed to the channel. And if you click on that little bell-shaped icon, YouTube will be nice enough to let you know just as soon as I post a new video. If you have any questions or comments, well, just leave them in the comments section down below. I'd be glad to hear from you. Until next time.